Thank you very much. Uh, I have to start with a brief commercial for my employer of the last 30 years, the New York Times. We don't actually ask that you read the paper every day. All you have to do is buy it every day. <laughs> and if you can't buy it, then at least next time you buy anything, a latte maker or something, you open the box, this little card flutters out, you fill it out for the warranty information. It says, how did you hear about our product? You must, you must check the box that says newspaper advertising. Okay? <laughs> now, what happens if I push this button? There we go. Okay. I'm going to talk about the difficulty in communicating about sustainability and energy. We have a history of misconceptions, wishful thinking, and fantasy. It's easier to see this in hindsight than it is currently. This is a 50-year-old concept car. It was supposed to go 5,000 miles between refueling. Uh, to refuel, you took the nuclear reactor and uh, you went to a shop, they took the nuclear reactor off the back of it and replaced it. Now, actually, I can't figure out which side the back is, but uh, without going into all the ridiculous talk of what people thought of nuclear power in 1958, I think we should take the broader point. A lot of new technologies never pan out the way that we thought they would or they, we hoped they would. That doesn't stop these technologies from capturing the public imagination. What's the modern version of the Ford Nucleon? It may be fusion. Uh, it's probably at least the fuel cell. Partisans communicate that the fuel cell gives off nothing but, but water, vapor, and electricity. A lot of people like that idea, including George Bush. He said in a State of the Union address that it was not too much to hope that a baby born when he gave the address, I think this was 04, uh, that that child would have a fuel cell vehicle as his or her first car. Now, a fairly weird thing happened for American politics, which is, when President Obama took office, we put a guy in charge of any energy policy who's a physicist. He actually knows something about these things. That was Stephen Chu. He has a Nobel in physics. He said the fuel cell wasn't particularly promising. It wasn't promising enough to command much federal support. Uh, the production of, of, of the hydrogen is quite dirty. The technology for storing the hydrogen, converting it into current, was extremely expensive compared to more promising approaches. And then what happened? Uh, the, he, he wanted to concentrate on things with more immediate payoff, like better batteries or advanced biofuels. So Congress told Chu, nah, what do you know? You, all you've got is a Nobel in physics. And so we're still pursuing fuel cells. Energy, it turns out, is a branch of politics. Let's, uh, all the, let's look at all this talk about energy with some skepticism and sustainability with some skepticism. Right now, a lot of the talk is focused on getting government help for this or that, wind or solar, nuclear, exotic ways to burn coal. This is not engineering talk. This is not bias-free scientific communication. All this comes down to new and interesting ways to spend public money. And by public money, I mean your money, not mine. I don't intend to be paying big bucks in taxes for more than another 10 or 15 years. It's our children's money we're spending here. Uh, you hear a lot about energy that comes from companies that want government help to send, sell their product. That's oil, gas, coal, nuclear, solar, and wind. Now, in fairness, this is a pretty complicated subject. Energy comes from a lot of different places, ends up in a lot of different places. I've got a spaghetti monster of a chart here. Uh, don't worry, this will not be on the midterm. Uh, one of the previous presenters had a similar chart. Uh, just take the point that we get energy in a lot of different places. We try to transform it. More and more, we turn fuel into electricity before we use it. Some of the newer sources, like wind or photovoltaics, and some not so new, like nuclear, are almost always fed into electricity. The tricks we're working on now is to turn electricity into a substitute for oil so the amount of carbon dioxide per mile can decline. That turns out to be surprisingly complicated, involving a battery we don't have yet. But there are other possibilities. You could use a nuclear plant to make liquid fuel instead of making electricity. You could turn coal into hydrogen and sequester the carbon dioxide. You could then use the hydrogen in cars. It's not clear which of these ideas will actually pan out and which ones are the Ford Nucleon of our new young century. But it's hard to explain to people right now that there's no number of windmills that will replace the deep water horizon. So we've thought, uh, we, we have though persuaded people uh, of some things that just aren't so. Take for instance, compact fluorescence. I did this calculation on five bulbs because one was too small to bother with. It does okay on carbon. It does okay on money. It doesn't do a thing for oil. 
we have to conserve, we have to save oil, here's your compact fluorescent. Anybody want to guess why? It's because there isn't any oil in our generation mix anymore. It's already 98.9% oil free, like one of those bad salad dressings. Uh, now, there's, here's another one, why wind is not the answer to all of our problems. This is a slide ah, uh, that the Energy Secretary, Stephen Chu, showed about a year ago for the Bonneville Power Administration. As you can see, demand for electricity went up and down every day by time of day based on need for heat, for lighting, for TV, etc. The wind blew when it wanted to. And when the wind contributed, it did so erratically. Uh, so the BPA needs just as much conventional generation as it ever had. With lots of wind machines, you could save fuel at some hours uh, using wind instead. This being the Pacific Northwest, you could save some water to run through a dam later. But while the wind was producing what the engineers call energy, it wasn't providing any capacity, that is, any ability to shut down old, dirty power plants on a permanent basis. Uh, we could solve this problem with more transmission, Here's an idea I'd like to communicate to you. When it comes to transmission, there's a public interest and there's an interested public, and those are two different things. I described wind first because it's by far the biggest and cheapest renewable. Here's another one, solar. Yes, one of the goals of, of the uh, NAE is to make solar less expensive. Uh, you still have to face this problem. This also came from the Department of Energy. That is one of solar's friends. Now, here's another problem in communication that doesn't get communicated. Uh, yes, all these things make energy, but our electric system needs more than just energy. It needs capacity. Capacity is the ability to bear load when, load when the load is there. If I have a 150 watt computer and a 150 watt wind machine, I don't want to be limited to using the computer when the wind is available. The nuclear plant will run about 90% of the hours in a year. The wind, if it's in a good place, will run 30 to 35%. The solar is down around 20%. So a megawatt of nuclear produces five times as much energy as a megawatt of solar. Uh, we've communicated to people that we can solve our problems with new appliances. You can, I can't really see the audience because of the light in my eyes. I know there's some young people out there and some older people out there. You can replace the Harvest Gold refrigerator does anybody here remember Harvest Gold when that was the only kind of appliance you could buy? Uh, the, uh, with some bizarre shade of, of maybe avocado. Uh, it's amazing we lived through the, the 80s, isn't it? Uh, you, you could save some money and some carbon with a new refrigerator, but you may end up buying a bigger one, or one with automatic defrosting or other features. So you may not save much actual electricity. At least if you do that, you'll be getting more work for your kilowatt hour. Here's another wrong thing we've communicated, that the internal combustion engine is a mature technology. Uh, this is an EPA chart. What it shows is that since 1975, we've used the same amount of gasoline to produce a vehicle that'll go from zero to 60 in nine and a half seconds. Uh, it used to be 14. Today, 14 is a dog. At the same time, we're driving around in cars that are substantially heavier. What we've done is, to reduce it to a, a single automobile. I used to own the one on the left. Uh, it died of rust. But uh, The Camry is about the same now as it was then. Uh, I'm missing it. There we go. Uh, but we can see we bulked it up. It's getting the same miles per gallon. It's increased in weight by about a quarter. Uh, and it's a lot zippier. Do we communicate this to anybody? Not really. If we went back to the, if we were serious about global warming, we went back to the performance and weight characteristics of the 1980s, we'd be using about 25% less gasoline. This is what really matters. Uh, this also doesn't get communicated. Buy a car that gets two miles more per gallon. You save a lot of carbon dioxide, a lot of money. You save the need for another deep water horizon. Or cut your, the, the, I, I get to and from work on a vehicle that gets six miles a gallon. It's called a bus. Uh, I know you have some of those out here. We could certainly have more. Uh, and and that would be, that would be a, a huge reduction in energy use. And that is a blank page. Why is that a blank page? Okay, because I'm out of things to say. <laughs> um, 
I, I want to tell a quick story about engineers. I have 12 seconds left. I was invited down to Pittsburgh to the old days when Westinghouse was still an independent company to the Power Systems Division. And the PR guy from Westinghouse is with me. And we walk into the room, and there's the vice president. He's got this table, long table with engineers around it. And he says, we have the ability around this table to do business in eight different languages. And the PR guy whispers to me, he says, yeah, and two of them are English. So there is a translation problem out here. And you had a very good keynote speech, but I'd add the point that you can write things other people can't read. Uh, there is a translation issue. Thank you very much.